In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I started to say, please be seated, but uh, if you're new to the Episcopal Church or St. Mark's, you may wonder uh, if we do this sort of thing every Sunday. And I will assure you, no, we don't. We typically start here in the sanctuary, and this uh, role play that we had going on during the reading of the gospel is something that typically occurs on uh, Palm Sunday. But those of you who have been here to St. Mark's before, did you notice that there was something different today about that reading? I will tell you that um, about two weeks ago, Jean Eady came to me in the office and she said, Sean, we have this option of reading this lesson. And as I looked it over, I was really drawn to what we heard today. And while I looked at the scripture and I was very excited about the message that I saw inside of it, I misunderstood how this fit into the, to the worship service itself. And so I said, well, that's the one we're going to read. It is an optional piece, but what I didn't understand is it was optional that we could add it on to the other part. And so technically by the rubrics, we're supposed to continue to read like this for about another 25 minutes. And in that 25 minutes, you would have heard Jesus being handed over to Caiaphas and Pilate being put on trial, being uh, mocked and whipped and then carrying his cross to Calvary there, crucified on the cross between two thieves, one on his right, one on his left. Uh, at some time during that reading, you're allowed to sit up until that point, but then suddenly you're asked to stand, and that's probably the part that you might have missed, so anybody that wants to stand right now could do so. Um, and there's another part in the reading where everybody in the congregation says, crucify him, crucify him, so repeat after me, crucify him, crucify him. All right, now your Sunday's complete. That part of the scripture is a part that we hear every year. And um, I will say that if you really want to focus on that part of the scripture, which is very important to Holy Week, I invite you, please come back and participate in the Stations of the Cross. Because you will not only get to hear the words, but you will get to walk through those stations and you will get to participate with the followers of Jesus on that day. But I'm gonna take you back to my original statement. I was really drawn by the story that we heard today about Judas. Because to be real honest with you, it was a story that I heard growing up and I have not heard for some time. The fact that, Jesus, that Judas had committed suicide, hung himself on a tree, I couldn't remember before these past couple of weeks, was that legend or was that really in the Bible? And we heard that today. And it's interesting that uh, a couple of weeks ago, Polly and I were in the office and we were talking about the gospel lessons throughout Lent. And she said to me, have you noticed that all of our lessons have to do with relationships? I said, no, I hadn't hadn't noticed that. She said, well, look at them. Jesus encounters the blind man. He encounters the woman at the well. He goes to Mary and Martha's house and raises Lazarus from the dead. It's one personal encounter after another, after another. And they're all either coming to Jesus, asking him to do something for them, or he is coming to them and laying hands on and healing and making them whole. And so I think that's partly the reason that I was drawn to this reading today is because again, in this reading, it's all about relationship. It's about the relationship between Jesus and his disciples and particularly the one that's named Judas. This guy named Judas. His mother must have hated him because everybody knows that's a terrible name. I mean, if you really want to get angry with somebody and really put them down, you call them, you Judas, you betrayed me. 
But Jesus saw something when he saw Judas for the first time, something in his heart that said to Jesus, this is a man that has gifts that can proclaim the love of God. This is a person that I want with me in my mission and ministry to this world. And while all of the gospels tell us that the disciples somehow or another have witnessed Jesus doing these miracles and um, teaching and preaching all of this time over this three year period and they somehow or another don't get it. And I think again in today's lesson, we hear how the disciples are kind of sleepwalking through their relationship with Jesus. They're there, they're paying attention, but they drift off and they, they really don't understand. Judas takes it another step. The disciples have an idea that Jesus is going to be this warrior king that's going to set them free and the Romans are going to be run out of town and Israel going to be a great nation again. But somehow or another, they're kind of coming around to maybe Jesus has another plan, but not Judas. Judas. Judas has his own plan. For Judas, it's all about the winning. For Judas, it's all about making sure we get what we want when we want it. And so if Jesus isn't going to do it by God, I will. And when he sees that Jesus is not raising up this army, he's not contributing to the treasury to buy arms to have this great battle, well, Judas decides that Jesus has got to go. And he goes off to the high priest and he says, what do you give me? What's it worth to you if I can turn this guy, Jesus, this rebel rouser over to you? And they said, well, we'll we'll give you 30 pieces of silver. Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room on that Passover night, the last night before he is put on trial, crucified. And he knows that his hour is coming and he knows that there is someone that is going to betray him and more than likely it's part of his inner circle, one of the 12. And he says so. Someone here is going to betray me and they all one by one says, surely not me, can't be me. Not me, Lord, is it? And Jesus responds, you're eating dinner with me. You're breaking bread with me. We're supposed to be family and yes, it's one of you. One of you who has dipped your hand into the same bowl that I have dipped my hand into, one of you will betray me. And then Matthew does this really fascinating thing with the language that he's using when there's this final climax of a confrontation between Jesus and Judas. There's a couple of times when Matthew uses the word rabbi and whenever he uses it, it's not a good word. Matthew's community is uh, a fledgling community that mostly Jewish people. They're trying to worship in the synagogue where they had grown up. And yet the rabbis are not convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God. So the rabbis are kicking the Christian Jews out of the synagogue. And Jesus back in the 23rd chapter of Matthew says, you know, don't be like those rabbis. All they want is power and long fringes and people to pay a lot of attention to them. Don't call them rabbi, don't call them father. Don't call anybody father because you only have one and that's your father in heaven. So rabbi in Matthew's community is not a term of endearment. And then on the other hand, there's a time when Matthew only uses the word friend a couple of times. Jesus tells two parables about a landowner who goes out and early in the morning, he hires some people and sends them out for a day's wages. And then at noon, hires some more, sends them out. And in the evening, hires some more and sends them out. And he begins to pay with the ones who have worked the least. 
and he gives them a full day's wage. And then the ones who have worked a half a day, a full day's wage. And the guys who've been working all day long through the hot sun say, boy, we're going to get a lot of money. And when they get their money, they get a full day's wage. And he began to complain. And the land over, under comes over and he says, look, friend. Look, friend. Not a term of endearment. Gee, this landowner is calling these people out. Look, you're not in charge. This is what you agreed to. Don't forget who's the boss. And then Jesus tells another parable. And give me a moment, I'll remember which one it is. <laughs> the king who's throwing the wedding banquet and he invites a bunch of people to come and they don't show up. And so he tells his servants to go out into the street, invite everybody to come. And when they get here, they don't have money. Let them put these wedding dresses on. They'll be dressed for the occasion. And when the king arrives, he begins to walk around and he sees one man not dressed in a wedding dress. And basically he said, I wanna be a part of the party, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna take anything from you. I, don't wanna, I wanna wear my clothes. And the king walks over and he says, friend, How'd you get in here? If you're not gonna wear the wedding dress, you can't be part of the party. And so he tells his servants to take this man and to cast him out in utter darkness. Rabbi is not a term of endearment and friend is not a term of endearment. And then take a look at what Matthew does here when Jesus and Judas meet for this last time. Jesus has gone off to pray. He takes with him Peter, James, and John, and he's praying, Father, not my will, but yours be done. I don't want to die. I, I don't want to go through the suffering and the pain, but, you know, if this is what's going to give your glory, if this is part of your plan, then not my will, yours be done. And the disciples are sleeping. And Jesus wakes them up and he says, come on. The hour's here, and it's time that my betrayer is coming. And Judas had already gotten the posse together. He had brought them in with their clubs and their lanterns, and he's already made arrangements. And I, in my mind's eye, I'm seeing this as a like a junior high play where you know he comes on board, and there, there's about 20 other people that stand directly behind him, and they're all waiting to pounce. And Jesus, Judas walks over and the first thing he says to Jesus is what? Greetings, Rabbi. And Jesus says, hello, friend. Yeah, relationship's not very good. Something's broken. Somewhere, Judas decided not God's will, but his will be done. Judas's will be done. I know I shared with some of you, we have a, a, a gallery of paintings upstairs with the 12 apostles, 12 apostles Jesus and St. Paul. And the artist is Kenneth Wyatt. And originally he had painted all the disciples except for Judas. And when he finished all of the disciples, his little eight-year-old daughter says, well, what about Judas, Daddy? He said, honey, I, ca I can't pay him. You may not understand what he did, but I, I just can't include him. And she said to him, yeah, but Jesus picked him. And if you'll notice, Judas is part of the collection. There's a brokenness in the relationship between Jesus Jesus and Judas. And Judas, I suspect, has not prayed the way that Jesus prayed. We know that every day he got up, went away from his disciples and prayed. Every evening he sent them home and went up on the mountain and prayed. And I suspect his prayers were like we heard today. Lord, what do you want me to do? And if that's what you want me to do, then give me the strength to do it. Not my will, but your will be done. And how many of us would have better lives if in the morning and in the evening that was our prayer. 
Anytime we're facing any kind of decision, we take a moment and say, okay, God, what is it that you want me to do? Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus is saying to him, friend, our relationship is broken. And boy, I really feel like throwing you out into utter darkness. And yet what he doesn't say and what the gospel says is, even though I'll die for Peter, I'll die for James, I'll die for John, and I'll die for you too. Judas, I love you so much, I will die for you too. Because you really are my friend. In this Holy Week, we come to the close of Lent. Lent is all about looking at our relationship with God and examining those things that keep us from a deeper knowledge of God and from living in a loving relationship with God. I invite you that as we come to the close of Holy Week that you participate in the things that the church is offering. On Monday, Thursday night, come to the Last Supper and remember how Jesus humbled himself and washed the feet of his disciples. I invite you on Friday to come and walk the Stations of the Cross to experience on some level the rejection Jesus must have felt when the world turned his back, their back to him and God turned his back to him and he was completely alone. I invite you to come for the great Easter vigil on Saturday nights where we start in utter darkness, that place of no hope. And yet one single candle was lit. And as the exalted is sung, the light grows. And we remember how time and time and time again, God has tried to bring us back into reconciliation and love. If you go through those, then Easter will really be something special this year. Amen.